This flag represents the freedoms that it gives. The freedom to come to this church. The freedom to speak. The freedom to vote. The freedom to assemble. That flag represents the right that we have to bear this flag. The veterans that fought for that flag also gives us the right to have the veterans to fight for this flag. Now, if you're a veteran of this flag, would you please stand up? You know what that means? Are you a child of the God? That is what this means. If you're a ch saved individual child of God, that is your flag that we fight for, and that is to give people the ability to see Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. That veteran that serves this flag is just as important as that veteran that served that flag. But you know that flag represents hardness, work, basic training, diligence. Sometimes we get to be a veteran of this flag by coming to church. Wow. That's not too hard to be a veteran of that flag, is it? Paul, a veteran of Christianity, gave his life to Jesus on the road to Damascus, was in prison, ready for persecution. His life was behind him, and he knew it, and he was a veteran. And at that time, he knew that his life was soon passed, and he had a little mentor boy by the name of Timothy. And Paul wrote him a letter, his last letter that he ever wrote, chained in a prison with just parchment and a pen. And he wanted to give the last decree to his young man that he led, that served under him. And that last letter... And that last word were this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. He says, You therefore must endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engages in warfare, entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. It, it's, it's the mindset of this. We look at our veterans and we watch these old veterans that served in Pearl Harbor and, and we, they're, they're old and they're sitting down with us new guys. I kind of, if you guys remember a few years ago, uh, Mona Campbell's dad, his name is Paul Ashbrenner, served at uh, Pearl Harbor. And he would come in and he would tell us the stories and, and he would talk and he, he went to the youth departments and he would share in the youth department. It's kind of like this. Paul Ashbrenner, somebody that is the oldest veteran that I've ever met, and he says, Bruce, I want to sit down and I want to tell you something. Out of respect of that old man, I want to sit down and I want to listen to what he had to say. Now, would he do things different than me? Oh, yeah. Did he like the same things I like? Absolutely not. But because of respect for that veteran, I sat down and I listened to him because he has done things that I have never thought about doing. He has endured things that I would never be able to endure. He lived a life that I would never be able to live. Do I agree with him? No. But do I respect him? Absolutely, yes. Why? It's because he's a veteran. He served. He honored. Now Paul is saying that same thing to us. I'm an old man. And I have fought the fight. I have ran my race. I have finished it. And I am finishing it strong. And I'm about ready to die. Timothy, I want to tell you some things. And I want you to take these at heart. You may do things different than me, and you should. You may not do the same things I did, and you shouldn't. But these principles are things that you have to do. If you're going to be a veteran of that flag, if you're going to be a veteran for Jesus Christ, you must do a few things. And church, I think we could take Paul's example. And take these few things that Paul is communicating to Timothy, and we could say, you know what? Yes. As a veteran of the family of God, as a writer of two-thirds of the New Testament, as a man that God gave the baton to after Jesus to start the church, I think we should take some inventory. 
And the first thing is that there's four words here. And I want to start with the last verse, enlist. We have to enlist. The Bible says again, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in this warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him to be a soldier. You know, in the United States of America today, we do not have the draft. We don't have a draft where every man or every woman automatically serves in the United States military. But what we do have is we have a volunteer sign up. And there are representatives in every city that goes out and looks for volunteers to sign them up to be in the military. And they voluntarily sign that line. And it may be for a lot of different reasons. It may be that their parents were military. It may be that they want their college paid for. It may be that they just want to have a couple years. Maybe they are patriotic and they want to serve. There's all kinds of reasons why men and women serve in the military. But we also, the Christian flag, we are also volunteers. We're also somebody that we are not mandated to give our life to Christ. A representative of that flag came to you and gave you an opportunity to see Jesus. And either you accepted it or you rejected it. But he didn't make you become a believer. It was a choice. It was a choice that you made. And in enlisting, that choice is what God has gifted you in. It says that please him who enlisted him as a soldier. What it also says in another, another translation, soldier wants to please his commanding officer. We want to please who is in charge. And if we enlist, well, there's one job that we must do. We must please the one who is in charge. And that person that's in charge of your life is Jesus Christ. The commanding officer of that flag is not higher than the commanding officer of that flag. Somebody give me an amen. That flag represents Jesus. We are his soldiers. We are here to honor him. In respect of him, we must honor him. That is the mandate that God has given to us. We have enlisted to serve Jesus. Not just to come to church. Not just to read the Bible. But to serve. And sometimes that serving will be tough. The second thing we have to do is sometimes we have to endure. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure. Painstakingly. Never giving up. People will hurt you. Trials will come across you. We must endure hardships. You ever endured a hardship? You ever had a calamity? Yes. We deal with those things all the time. But we can't give up on our commanding officer and what Jesus Christ has done for us because of a hardship. We must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What that means is, is things take place. We are not in control. But what we must do, even though we are not in control, we are still obedient to the commands of our commanding officer. When we are in that flag and the commanding officer tells us to do something, you don't have a right to say no. You say, yes, sir. When we listen to that flag and that commanding officer tells us to do something, we don't have a right to say no. We have a right to say, yes, sir. Why? Because that commanding officer gave his life, shed his blood to die for you and I, and we have no way for heaven except for obedience to that person. That person is Jesus Christ. Endure hardships. Sometimes we'll do something. We don't know why. But we are his representative. We are his ambassador. We speak for him, which means sometimes people will not like what you say. And some people may not agree with what you say, but that doesn't make any difference. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure. Fight. Stand up. Not be embarrassed. When you're at lunch, don't be afraid to pray. Don't be afraid to share your faith. People may mock you, laugh at you, and ridicule you. You must endure hardship. Hardship is not somebody just laughing at you. Hardship is I'm going to stand up in the face of adversity 
And I am going to stand up for my commanding officer. So we must enlist and we must endure the next engage. We must engage. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Engaged. We have to be a church. We have to be individuals that are engaged. The idea of what he's talking about is in a battle. Military over here, military over here, and you're skirmishing and you're fighting. You're engaged. You're not just over there watching the fight. You're in the middle of the fight. You're inducing people to Jesus Christ. You're doing what God wants you to do. You're sharing your faith. You're reading the Bible. You're growing. You are his representative. We are engaged. Engaged. Doesn't mean we just come set and sour. It means we get involved. It doesn't mean we just accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and say, I'm happy because I'm going to heaven. Engaged. That means it's proactive. That means in my home. That means at my school. At my work. I'm engaged because of him. Now, if you're not a child of God, this doesn't make any difference. You can't be engaged with somebody that you don't know. You can be disengaged. But if you're a child of God and this flag represents your faith, we have to be engaged with that. That doesn't mean you have to be mean. It doesn't mean that you have to hurt. It means that you have to be a representation of Jesus Christ in this world. And we have to give that representation, not as the world stands, but as Jesus stands. And as Jesus stands, he says this, You shall know you're my disciples if you have what? Love one for another. We are not fighting to hurt. We're fighting to love. We're not fighting to destroy. What we're fighting to do is to win. We are the representation of Jesus Christ. And our job is to love them so they can see Jesus Christ in us. So they can give their life to him. So they can be part of the workforce. It's not to destroy it's not to ridicule. It's not to win. It's to love. It's to let them know that Jesus Christ loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. But we have to engage. We have to engage because this world is fighting against some principalities and powers that we have no comprehension of. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 4 and 5 says this. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make obedient to Christ. Our power, our authority is not with weapons of this world. It's with God. It's understanding that it has work to do. Soldiers of Jesus Christ prepared to engage through basic training. They prepare to fight before they go into war. And as a Christian, you have to train. That's what the church is for, to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. We have to train ourselves to do what God has called us to do. So often we give our life to Jesus Christ and we never train. We never pray. We never read. We never take classes. And we try to live a Christian faith through the world and through our flesh, and we fail every day. We fail because we haven't properly taken care of ourselves. In the military, it's demanded of you to train. In this army, it's demanded of you to train. He says, equip, learn, grow. Not be babies of the word, but grow to be men of maturity. Not just come to church, not just to call your name a Christian, but to get involved, to do something great, because let me tell you something. This world is not a Christian world. We are fighting an uphill battle. And that uphill battle has to have the power of Jesus Christ or we are going to lose our faith. We will never lose our salvation. We'll never lose our eternity. But what we must do is we have to stand for the cause of Jesus Christ and stand and fight. And it's not against another political system. What we're standing against is Satan, is it demons from hell. We must stand. Our fight, our fight is here. No, our fight is here with his power to the demons of hell. I tell you, if we don't stand and fight, we're going to get so disillusioned. And you know what Satan wants us to do? Step back. Chill out. 
Church, don't worry about it. Just take a nap. Let me handle it for a while. And we're going to wake up 5, 10, 15 years down the road asleep in the church. And this world is taking over all Christian-based influence. Because the church, me and you, have been asleep at the wheel. That's why we have to engage. We have to engage in a way that when people see us, when they know what's going on, we have to say, you know what? I'm a child of the king. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. It's not against a political system. It's not against another country. We are here to rejoice in what Jesus has done for us, to enlist others into this kingdom. We are here to be a representation of Jesus Christ, period. Now, how do we do that? We have to engage in the culture, yes. But they shall know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Not if you can fight, not if you can yell, not if you can argue, not if you can debate, but can you love? If you can't love, you may not be his disciple. How do you love? You love people because who they are, not because of the position that they hold. You love them for who they are. You love them no matter what, and you love them to Jesus. Love them to Jesus, not beat them up to Jesus. How many people have been saved because you beat them up? They've been saved because of what Jesus Christ has done for you and you are his ambassador to Christ. That's how we engage. Don't wink. Don't go to sleep. Because the last one is entangled. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. So often we get so busy doing the mundane, we forget the purpose of our salvation. Countless Christians often coming to faith and get so caught up in the church or caught up in their life, caught up in the skirmishes of the church, that they forget that we're not fighting in the church. Saved people are saved church is supposed to do is save those that are lost and so often we get so caught up in what I don't like about you and what you don't like about me that we forget that that's not who we're fighting for we are entangled in the wrong fight what we must be entangled in is the fight for Jesus Christ what we must do is no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life we must stand for what Jesus Christ has done for us Entangled. We can take that entanglement and talk about our own personal life as well. Oh, it's easy to talk about an argument with him and arguing with her and get entangled out here. But sometimes in this war, if we don't self-evaluate our life, we lose influence in their life. And we as the church sometimes get entangled in our sin and in our mess so much that we can't share our faith because we are stuck in a stockade of sin with bounds upon us that we can't get out. So if we're going to be in warfare and we're going to be fighting for the cause of Jesus Christ, we have to enlist in his company. We have to endure hardships. We have to engage. And then we have to not be entangled with this life. We have to want salvation through Jesus Christ more than we want the sin that you're in. More than you want the popularity of people. What we must do is I want the praise of Almighty God. That's what Paul told young Timothy. And he said it. So I'm about ready to die. In the next week, I'll be gone. And I'm going to write you this last letter. And this last letter, young Timothy, is my heart. I've seen a lot. I've gone through a lot. I've been beaten, I've been shipwrecked, I've been stoned. I'm tired. There's set up for me something that I cannot comprehend, and that is my reward in heaven. I'm an old man. I'm dying. You're young. It's not going to be easy. You can't take the easy way out. You can't just play the game of Christianity. It's going to be a fight. You have to do something that you don't want to do. You have to stop playing and engage. 
Now I get caught up, entangled with the stupidity of this world. But no, what you're doing is far more important. I want to honor the veterans of that flag because they gave us the right to be here today. But that does not change the responsibility that you and I have to represent that flag. To represent that flag means I'm under the commanding officer of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he has given us the book of the Word of God to detail what and how we do it. Yes, I honor that flag. I am thankful to live in America. I am thankful for the veterans that fought to give us the right to do what we're doing today. Praise God for them. But it's not about them when we're talking about Jesus. It's talking about the veterans of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we his ambassadors? If you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ, that means you speak for Jesus. You speak what Jesus would say. You do what Jesus would do. That's what an ambassador is. And if you're an ambassador and you don't speak for Jesus, if you don't speak for the United States of America, if you're an ambassador, you know what they would do? They would remove you as that ambassador. What Jesus is saying, if you're my ambassador, speak for me. Live for me. Die for me. It's about what I have done for you, and I want to reach this world for Jesus Christ. Stand up for him. Love him. Honor him. Don't let the affairs of this world to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. To bless you the way God wants to bless you. We are veterans of Jesus Christ. There's going to be a day a young man or a young woman comes up to you and talk to you about what Jesus has done for you. Just like Paul Asperger did for the United States of America in Pearl Harbor. We sit and we listen to him. One day there's going to be somebody... Maybe when you're old, or maybe even tomorrow, it sets and talks to you about your faith. Don't be embarrassed. Stand up and say, my Lord and my Savior delivered me out of the life of sin. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And he redeemed me. And he's forgiven me. And I'm going to heaven. Not because of anything I have done. It's all because of what he did. And I can give him the honor and the glory in every area of my life.